Hello and welcome to the 100th episode of Man Enough. We wow. did it. 100. And the only reason we were able to do it is because of the women that are sitting at this table with us right now. So if you're, uh, if you're not watching and you're listening to this, I am joined by my wife, Emily. And I am joined oh, by my sweet, wonderful wife, Natasha. He's always, got a, he's always got a one-up me. Did you guys notice that? <laughs> my sweet, wonderful wife. Oh, my gosh. You See, this is what's, why it's so good we do this show. They need group therapy. <laughs> we need. I think Justin and I, that's what we've learned. Because in my spirit, there was no one-upping you, Jay. It was just, I looked at her and I just, those are the words that came out of my mouth. So why did it become about you versus about her? Mm. Mm. That's a great question. I guess I was feeling like I was insecure because I should have given my wife more adjectives. Ooh. Um, yeah, because we need more adjectives. Uh, yeah. That's what we need. Uh, so. <laughs> but you know that I think you're sweet and wonderful too, I right? do. I do know that. I think that was very sweet how you introduced. Let's yes. celebrate it. Thank That's you. Thank you. Congratulations. You know what I think? And congratulations. Here's what I think. Wow. I think you and I should go have lunch. And I think that because we've done all these episodes and because this show has been about us being a work in progress and us learning in real time, our 100th episode should be the women of Man Enough without the men. Hmm. Ooh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, That's you do. Sounds later, great, ladies. but it makes me really nervous. See you later. What does that mean? It means we're leaving? No, it means like you and I are leaving. Oh, we're okay. physically leaving. Yeah. We're not going to be listening. Okay. You support this list? I so I wholly so I'm 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 in if if Tasha and and, and Emily want to do right. it oh we're in let's do there it. okay let's do it all right all let's, right. Go. let's go. go get out of here I love you too Liz love you. I love you more all right. being man enough what does that mean it's really manly to mess up admit you're wrong and then grow I couldn't accept that I was evil so maybe I'm broken but those broken things can be corrected. Intimacy between a father and a son is me just wanting to like put my head in your lap. I love you, son. You haven't called me a benevolent sexist, but my experience is women are better. Even if it's a positive, it's still not equality. I don't blame men for that. I just blame the system. This is Man Enough. Welcome to Man Enough. Thank um, you. I'm Liz Plank. Oh, hi, and I'm Emily Baldoni. And I'm Natasha Heath. Hi, welcome to our 100th episode <laughs> of yes, Man yeah, Enough. We made it. <laughs> we really did it. We did. We d we've done so well. Yes. No, yeah. truly, I couldn't, I couldn't have done this without you because I know how much you put into your marriage. I know how much you put into your families and into your household. And I think that it is... So it's the invisible labor, right, that we've talked about and we've talked about when you um, graciously came on the show mm -hmm. um, that we often don't get to see. Mm -hmm. And so I know that, yeah, the only reason that Jamie and uh, Justin were able to do 100 episodes is because of the two of you. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for thank saying you. that. And I also have to say that the two of them love and adore and admire you so much. Yes. And so do Natasha and I, mm. <laughs> and thank you for guiding them through 100 episodes and mm. being the woman, being that <laughs> voice. The that voice. I, thank you for showing up for that yeah. big job for that. in so many ways, yeah. not just here, but also definitely here with, with Justin you. and Jamie. So thank, thank you. you. Well, it's funny because I, I do feel like, well, obviously you've both been on and, and I want to talk about that because especially uh, Emily, you came on really in, in, in that first week of production of the show. Mm -hmm. So you were one of the first episodes and here you are right. at the hundredth episode. So I'm curious wow. sort of how have you seen them grow or, or sort of change yeah. in, in your own personal lives with them? I have seen Justin grow in so many ways. We've both been on a really fast trajectory of healing and evolution to use that like personal mm -hmm. evolution. And he he has changed so much in the last couple of years. And I feel like thanks to Man Enough, we also, you know, that he brings home topics into our house and then we discuss it or he prepares for an episode by discussing it with me. So I've really gotten to see how his thinking around things and his opinions around things are kind of molding and shifting and evolving. And in short, he has really um, come home to himself. Wow. And it's yeah. really, really beautiful to witness. Mm. 
Yeah. And is there a specific example of a moment that you were like, oh, this is a different, this is different? I mean, there are so many things, but I would say that the biggest thing is that he's able to lean into the role of husband and father in a very different way. I know he has always loved that role as my husband and as a father, but in our very patriarchal culture, yeah. there is such a pull to just be out there and create and do and achieve and be better and be bigger and all of the things. And I think it's very easy to get into that pattern of prioritizing that because that means that he comes home and he provides for the family mm -hmm. in a good old fashioned way, yeah. right? By bringing home the bacon and doing the work out there. And I see him now leaning in so much more into the the sweetness and the joy of being home, of being with me, being with our children. And when he's able to calm down in that sense, he's able to also really listen mm. and really see things that are needed. Like his intuition with the kids is getting stronger, where his intuition kind of kicks in before mine does at times. And he knows what's right to do in a moment. So I think that's what I mean by a coming home to himself. He's slowing down. Yeah. He's finally slowing down a little bit, and it's really beautiful to witness. Mm, I love yeah. that. Tasha, do you, yeah, do you have, a, does anything come to mind for you? Yeah, absolutely. The word that comes to mind with Jamie in the last, has it been a year, two years? Two, two years, two years. Two and wow, and half, wow. Yeah. is like a softening. Okay. And there's a, a specific example I can give. He tends to give love in like, quote unquote, tough love, you know, with like yeah. a coach, like, come on, you got this, you can do this, yeah. you know, that can be his energy sometimes. And I know a lot of people respond to that, mm. but I don't. Mm. And it, and <laughs> we have kind of like bumped heads where he's tried to encourage me through life or in a situation or in a moment. And I just can't hear that. Yeah. And he kind of is like, what do you mean? I'm like giving you the best that I've got. And I'm like, that doesn't work for me. And, you know, something that I'm working through in motherhood is, you know, sometimes I can come off uh, with like an irritable tone or a snappy tone. And I'm really trying to change that automatic like response with my children that I know that was learned or passed down or what I experienced, right? I'm really trying to, I'm working on that. And at times, you know, before in the past, before the podcast, you know, he he would bring it to my attention in a way that was hard for me to hear that made me feel defensive. And just recently he ha it happened, but he did it in such a way that was soft mm. and loving and, you know, like I'm on your side. Mm. And it, and it was easy for me to hear like, Hey babe, did you, did you hear that? Did you notice that moment? Mm. Instead of like, Hey babe, we shouldn't be talking to kids like that. And so I, I just feel like there's a softening happening of like, you know, we talk about love languages, like you learn what your per partner needs, not just how you give love, but yeah. how they receive it. And I feel like he's making adjustments when it comes to like hard conversations to give me what I need when things get hard. Like I need mm. softness. Mm. I need real tenderness when things get uncomfortable. And I feel like he's showing up in that way. Yeah. I do think that we choose partners um, that have lessons for us, mm -hmm. right? And if, if you're lucky, right? And it seems like in both your cases, they obviously learned a lot from you. And through this podcast, you have been top of mind for them all of the time, right? They bring you up constantly and I think are, are reflecting even when, you know, when you're not being brought up, they are reflecting about their marriages and about their relationships with you constantly. And so it's great to see th them evolve in, in that way. And do you feel like you've also evolved in a certain way. Like there's a lot of content out there right now. Like if you want to know why marriage is uh, bad for women, <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, I mean, on TV and in movies, not necessarily, but in terms of, you know, social media. And, and I think where there's a lot of, you know, data and, and a lot of young women who are reluctant uh, mm -hmm. to get married, reluctant to have kids. I still don't know if I want to have kids mm. a little bit for this reason where um, I, I, we're, we're still living in a very unfair society to mother. Others. Mm -hmm. And not just in, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff or interpersonally, but like it's institutionalized. Like mm -hmm. I think hatred of mothers literally is institutionalized in our policies. But that being said, are there things that women can do <laughs> in their relationships or in their families? Not that it's 
their job to fix society and to fix this bias against mothers. But it, are there things that you have done in your marriage that have made marriage work for you? I feel what comes to mind <clears throat> right away is is learning to take up space mm. and um, know that it's okay to do it in a way that doesn't feel like I'm undeserving of it. Because I feel like we're, we're carrying, we're bringing so much and carrying so much of that as women, like be little, be small, be quiet. I know that I, I, brought, I brought in that baggage with me in marriage, not that Jamie brought it in, I brought it in as a woman in our society with my you know, history and my ancestors and whatever, mm -hmm. that we have to know and understand that it's okay to speak up. That I'm not gonna die if I speak up. Yeah. That my husband's not gonna, you know what I mean? And gonna leave you, right? He's not, not gonna, gonna leave. Abandoned. You know, it's okay for things to be. It's okay to say something uncomfortable. It's okay to make your partner uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just keep thinking of a, a great friend uh, that says that learned from someone else. Discomfort does not mean disunity. Mm -hmm. mm. It's okay. Like we're humans. We're messy. We're gonna bump heads. Like it's okay for things to get uncomfortable. It doesn't mean the relationship is over. It doesn't mean someone's gonna walk out the door. It just means okay we got to breathe through it we might have a day or two of discomfort and then like we'll we just got to like sit with those feelings and then we come back and, and we adjust hopefully you know like hopefully mm -hmm. we find partners that are willing to adjust yeah. and be uncomfortable right like number one find a partner that's right. willing to do the work and mm -hmm. right and then luckily when you're with a partner like that and I definitely have a partner that's like that I had to learn throughout the years to the, it's okay to say something that I know might ruffle his feathers and might make him defensive and might and but to still speak my truth Mm -hmm. um, and to say it in a way that's kind and grounded and not hysterical or exaggerated, you know, like I had to learn how to say it. Not only did I have to be brave enough to say it, I had to learn how to say it. And how do you say it? <laughs> I, you know, um, I don't, I, I don't tiptoe around the thing okay. I want to say anymore. Like maybe we could kind of sort of, what do yeah. you, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe, huh? You know, mm. like all that language we use yeah, instead of being yeah. like, I'm really feeling overwhelmed. Like just the other day, I was like, ooh, I'm feeling overwhelmed. The house is just kind of, ooh, like boxes were everywhere, we were spring cleaning. I was just feeling overwhelmed. And yeah. I was able to just say, ooh, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed because the boxes are everywhere. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Nothing. What's wrong? Mm -hmm. Nothing. I'm fine. Right. Like not to hide real, true mm -hmm. feelings, feelings yeah. big or little, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. just like take up space. Yeah. Men do it all the time. <laughs> My husband has no problem. <laughs> no problem. Saying what he's feeling when he's <clears throat> feeling it, you know? And he doesn't, and I never, and I don't feel defensive, and I don't, I mean, I used to get defensive, mm -hmm. not anymore. That's my journey. But, um, yeah, just taking up space and not being afraid to take yeah. up space. I, I love that so much. And it makes me think of, you know, because we talk about just like say the truth and show up as you. And what does that require, right? Just to take it a little bit deeper is that goes back to how honest you are with yourself and the work that we do on ourselves. That's something that's been major for me and Justin that has helped our marriage in so many ways is that I've done my work on me and he's been doing his work on him. And it's very deep. It can get very, very challenging. But in that work, I can actually figure out who the hell I am. So that in a moment when I need to speak my truth, I know what that truth is. Yeah. And because I know that it's coming from a deep core place that feels truthful to me, it's a little bit easier not to apologize for it. It's a little bit easier to take up that space because it matters, and I know what's coming from my soul. Mm. <laughs> so I think it's that whole thing of know thyself, mm. right? Why does it say know thyself on so many temples around the world? Because the greatest medicine is for us to know ourselves in like the, the deepest layers of ourselves because then we can show up authentically. Mm. And Justin and I, we always talk about the, the, the best form of activism is self-activism. Fight for yourself. Figure out who you are. Do the work. Like, really do the work and go deep. And then you can show up in the world with all of your gifts mm -hmm. because they're endless once you connect to that place. Mm -hmm. So be curious. Be curious about yourself and do the work and then dare to take up that space. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. I love that so much. It's it's such a lesson that I've been, yes, sort of still, that I'm still learning. Mel Roberts, she has this idea of like, let them, like, let them let you down, let them be mad at you, let Mm -hmm. them be disappointed. Mm -hmm. That I think for a lot of people, but I think women have a tendency to go into this where we contort ourselves so mm. that we don't get abandoned. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and again, that abandonment uh, very, in some cases is true. And I feel like I lost a lot of time in dead end relationships or in relationships that were clearly no longer serving us and, and me, but but thinking, yeah, n- not revealing truly who I am, like not letting mm. men let me down. Like mm-hmm. I became really good at that. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I think women can become so good at it that they don't know that they're doing it because yeah. it's almost second nature. And survival. Yes, survival to want to preserve the relationship over preserving yeah. yourself. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think we learned that when we're little, yeah. right? And back then it you know, it really felt like it was going to save our life. Mm -hmm. We mold and we contort ourselves to be this perfect little something so that people stick around because the the adults are our survival, Mm -hmm. right? So we had to get really good at that. And then we bring that with us into adult life. And it's just we're wired for that. We're wired to fit in and make everybody else comfortable and happy. Um, And I think we've actually forgotten who we are. Mm -hmm. I think we've forgotten how to just be free and not feel like we have to protect ourselves because of the society and the world that we grew up in. Yeah, Jamie and I were just talking about this, how I, when he first met me, he would notice that we would be, I would be in a group, even if, even a group of women, and I would sit back and kind of just be observant and listen, and I wouldn't like chime in. And, but he knew me. He was like, why, you have so much to say and offer. Like, why, why do you get so like laid back and quiet? And I, it just became a default Mm -hmm. for me. I never took the time. I realized when I reflected on that, when he asked me, I realized I don't bother to ask myself when I'm in a setting like that, what do I think Mm -hmm. about what everyone's talking about? What do I have to say? Do I have anything to contribute? I would just shut off. Oh, mm-hmm. interesting. I would literally just shut off and, and become an observer. And that had been like years of me doing that. And I think with work and, you know, growth and parenting and marriage, you know, you grow and you little. And now, now I take the time to, to sit and to know myself. Like, what do I like? What do I think about this topic? Mm. What do, you know, I take the time to pause and actually th- ask myself, what do I think about this yeah. topic right now? Yeah. This is where men can be so, such great teachers <laughs> in our lives and vice versa, right? That traditional masculine, traditional feminine, you know, characteristics, right, are, are the ones we've been really pushed towards in our society and in our culture. And men have so much to learn from women when it comes to emotional connection, connection to oneself, relationships with others, and, and sort of nurturance, right? But women have so much to learn around confidence and so around, much. right, being more assertive. And yes. I remember being in a relationship with this guy and I you know I wouldn't even if someone didn't reply to my email and it was like the most important email of my life I was like I would not uh follow up oh. I was like oh they don't they don't want to talk to me they don't they don't want to talk mm. to me. no oh I, I bothered them oh god and I remember him being like I follow up like 14 times and then like <laughs> that's why I got this thing and that's why I got that thing and yeah. you know people mm. are just busy like no you're apologies in, yes no apologies and they don't personalize things in, yes. in the way that we do right yeah. mm. again we're super generalizing here um, there are women who, who don't do that and there are men who do do that sure. but but uh, yeah I, I think across the board I, I think that that's one of the coolest things about, I I think, heterosexual relationships or friendships, right? Just relationships between men and women where, you know, and and I do think there's a happy medium where we all kind of not live in the center, but kind of get to exist not in those polarities, Mm -hmm. you know, where where there are so many things that are amazing about being a woman in our society. But I, yeah, I feel like there's a certain kind of characteristic that was like pushed down our throats. Mm -hmm. And being in true authentic relationships with men has helped me kind of get more into balance, I guess. But okay, so we didn't, I totally am mesmerized uh, by both of you. (laughs) And I forgot to ask our first question, which is, when was the last time that you didn't feel enough? Sitting down into this chair. (laughs) Did I? No, but for real, for real. Like I have this annoying little editor I was going to say a bad word, but I'm going to keep it say to myself. It. Say it. Um, but this little thing sitting here is just like, oh, you're going you're gonna to fail. You're not going to do enough. 
You're not going to be enough. You're not going to be smart enough. The inspiration is not going to come through you. <laughs> you're not going to have any interest. You, you know, you, you get the drill. It's just like, meh, 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 meh. it just sits there and it just, it's, its voice is getting quieter and quieter mm. because I am doing the work. Mm. So I know where it's coming from and I've learned to love this little alien sitting here <laughs> <laughs> because it's not going to go away in any other way but me loving it so hard. So I know where it's coming from. And then I have another little angel sitting on this other shoulder saying, hey, you got this. You have something to add. Just like, mm -hmm. just do it. It'll come. So yeah, just just when I sat down here, that 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 nagging thought of, ooh, I may not be enough today mm -hmm. was here. Very mm -hmm. present. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad same. the angel was louder. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Pretty much the same, but I'll share yesterday, no, two days ago. Uh, it was it was the t the night I came home and I was just kind of agitating on the boxes and I was just overwhelmed. <laughs> Jamie, he can. It's a beautiful gift he has <laughs> that he can just look at me for a millisecond and know that I'm off. Like, yeah. are you good? And I feel he, almost like he has before that with me. I, I even <laughs> before I know that I'm a little off, he's yeah. like, "You okay?" He can yeah, just yeah, like yeah. read me yeah. real mm. quick, and I'm like, "Yeah, oh, I, don't, I don't know. I feel agitated and." And I, I, I felt bad for being agitated. And I, but I know we're human and I know we have those moments. And, you know, I just, I didn't feel, I just felt bad about myself in that moment. And not that he like, he didn't, he just noticed it, right? He didn't let say like, well, you shouldn't be or why, you know, he didn't say anything badly about it. But it was just the fact that I I was like, I felt naked, like, oh man, I'm having a human moment, and you're noticing mm. it, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm being annoying and agitated, and I don't know how to get out of it. And just after that moment, I was like, dang, I wasn't a perfect little person in that moment, <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> which is so yes. ridiculous. And yeah. I'm really working on that, of like having, I'm learning to have so much more forgiveness mm. and grace yeah. for myself. Like, right. oh, mm. welcome to being human, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the same forgiveness and grace that you have for. Jamie and yeah. your kids. And, exactly. You know, well, I do want to talk about kids because you're both raising boys. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very curious about what that has been like. And what do you think, like, how did you think it would be, you know, being a, a mother to a young boy? Like, what's the gap there between what it actually is? Or like, did it change your perspective on masculinity? I don't know if I had any idea of what yeah. it was going to be like to raise a boy. And I only have one sister, so I didn't grow up with boys in my family. And I also didn't care to read anything about it. <laughs> I, did, I did very little research. I know you and I share that same thing, Natasha. We were like, okay, let's have the best birth ever. Yes. And then you don't think about <laughs> a day all after. the years after that. I had no idea what to expect um, but it's very, very interesting to be a mama of both a little girl and a boy and to see how different they are. And in our family, actually, I think you guys are a little similar to that. Our girl is like the bold, loud one, and she's okay. colorful, and she's confident, and she's just yeah. sparkly. Eldest daughter. Energy. Eldest daughter. There you go. <laughs> and Maxwell is this sweet little love bug, very tender, very sensitive. I mean, so is my daughter. But he's just a very soft boy. And it became obvious very early that, ooh, like we really need to tend to this tender heart hmm. because it is so beautiful and we don't want him to lose it. <laughs> because that, that was one thing that I did know that that can happen to boys. I was told. Okay. So that's one thing that we've tried to focus on as much as possible is allowing space for all of his feelings and helping him understand and know that he is amazing just the way that he is in his softness, in his wildness, in all of the things, that he can be all of the things. Um, now, he's still very young. He's about to turn six. Mm -hmm. So I know that things are about to change now with hormones and everything. They say six is actually a really big milestone. So whoo, buckle up. <laughs> what happened? I just know that Waldorf has a whole family workshop on six. Oh, wow. Yes, okay. specifically for boys. For boys oh. Because things happen 
hormonally, and it's a big milestone going from being kind of in your own little world with your own family to realizing that, oh, there's a whole world out there and relationships to be made, and mm -hmm. I'm this person in this group of people and this person in that group of people, and they just start, start mapping their universe. Okay. And it can be very overwhelming, absolutely beautiful, all of the things. Okay, I got it. And mm -hmm. I think more than anything, it's so important for these boys to know that they belong in the family, that we, as, without being a helicopter parent, but really being present parents so that the parents come first and peers come next. Because I think boys can have a tendency to very quickly move into peer land and really identify and lean more on their peers than on their parents. Mm. Gabor Mate talks so yeah. much about that, hold on to your children. I think it's more important now than ever that we are just really solid, really present parents and full of acceptance. Yeah. 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 I, I didn't know what to expect with the boy either. I had a sister as well growing up. And I think that's something that keeps taking Jamie and I back is just how sweet and sensitive and soft and caring and nurturing this little boy we have is who equally still loves transformers and trucks and rocks and, you know, throwing and climbing. Like he's just has just as much of that energy as he does this tenderness mm -hmm. that like melts us every day. And and I also like my biggest prayer is that he doesn't lose that, that the world doesn't take that from him and that we don't take that from him. And we're, you know, we constantly try to just uphold that for him and reflect to him constantly like, oh, you are just so sweet. You're so affectionate. You're mm -hmm. so loving. You're so, you know, like letting him see that you are this and it's beautiful, right. you know, to let him know that that's a valuable, though those are valuable mm -hmm. traits that he has. And it's so amazing, like just how... You know, just like what a whole person he is. Mm. And I, again, my prayer is that he doesn't lose it, you know, mm. through society, that society doesn't rob that of him. And there's um, Niobe Way. She wrote a, an entire book about how boys have these intimate, tender friendships and, and close relationships with, with particularly other boys um, in the way that girls do too, right? A around that age. And then, yeah, it, something sort of happens. Mm. Um, yeah, they're, they're sort of take it, l taking in the culture, right? That right. it's the messages aren't just coming from the family, it's coming from society. Yes. And, um, and they're learning about what role they're expected to play. And that, yeah, there's a real um, loss actually, mm. like of that intimacy with other with other boys around that age and um, it, it sort of is a precursor to the male loneliness crisis that you know we know so much about <laughs> you guys are like for people who are not watching they're like both about to stop <laughs> what yeah. would you, so what would you want for these boys what do you think is is missing or, or what are the mistakes that people are, are are making with boys right now I just want them I want him to feel safe always to like show up with that tender heart and not be shamed for it or like, that's not mad enough or, you know, oh, just all the things that come with that. I just hope he never like is never shamed mm -hmm. for crying, for having a tender heart, for wanting to still, he still wants to hug things out. Like that's when he oh. wants to resolve a problem, he still like needs a hug oh. that like helps him resolve. And I saw it happen at school. He still is doing it, thank God. Oh. And, his, and his friend hugged him right back, you know. So mm. I, I just hope that, that those, those things aren't robbed because we need that. You should see our boys together. They hold hands oh. everywhere they go. Oh. And when they see each other, they just we, – Justin recently shot a slow motion video of the two of them just like running towards each other and then embracing and spinning around and the biggest smiles on their faces. Yeah, such joy. And the preciousness and the beauty of that. Mm -hmm. oh, may they never lose that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the time will come when that feels a little much <laughs> to them, but that, 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 they, that they never get – shy to share their joy and their sensitivity and their love for one another mm -hmm. yeah. or for anybody. Yeah. There's just something so precious about it. So I do think that something that we can do is to allow our boys to 
also be little in these precious little gems, you know, not make them grow up too fast, mm -hmm. not make them do things too fast. Keeping the magic of childhood is one of the best things and medicines for humanity that we could possibly do. Keeping the magic for children and not getting them into... I mean, if they enjoy sports, wonderful. But like, don't get your kids too busy too fast, mm -hmm. or academia, or whatever it is. Yeah. Like, let's let's let them be children. Yeah, there's such value in that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's so funny. I did this video uh, on this other podcast I, I'm I'm doing, and we were asking like grown men if like they like their birthdays because we just started noticing we're like women love their birthdays and <laughs> men don't seem to like enjoy it as much as women. Like what's going on there? And it's drawing attention to myself. I'm not supposed to be drawing attention to myself. So that's somehow vain or it's feminine. But one thing that really came up is it was almost in the subtext of what they were saying, which was like, I'm a gr I'm an adult now. Like mm. I'm a man. Mm. Boys celebrate their birthdays. And then you mm. ask them about their birthdays at, like as boys and it, it's just their eyes light up and they'll tell you all oh. these stories, right? And so I think, you know, we talk about the adultification of girls and particularly black girls. And I think it hurts girls in, in sort of different ways. But there's something that happens when like a boy becomes a man. Mm -hmm. and, and this is across cultures, like anthropological evidence of the way that we sort of squeeze out the tenderness out of boys in order for them to become men and then the mm. things that they sort of lose right. as a result of it. Mm. Liz, how has it been after 100 episodes mm -hmm. of being the only female mm. co-host yeah. of Man Enough. Yeah. How's it going? Wow. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is our only all female, we've never not had a man oh, wow. at this table. When Justin first sort of pitched this podcast uh, to me, he, when, when he mentioned that he wanted Jamie to be a part of it, and I, I had not, I didn't know Jamie yet. Um, and it was awesome to get to know him on, on set. And, and I'm can't imagine the show without him. Mm. But originally, I told Justin, I was like, and people of, of our team, I was like, I'm just gonna, it's just gonna be bros growing out. And it's not even that, that because they're, you know, bad guys, but women can really tend to, and this happens to me all the time, like, I'll be in a group with, with men, and no matter how progressive and amazing they are, like, I just don't talk as much. Mm. I don't yeah. say what I think as much. Mm. I will mm -hmm. be kind of, um, you know, take a, a, a backseat. And when, when, when I'm with a group of men where I don't do that, I know I'm with a really, really good group, mm. and that's how I felt on this podcast. Mm. And it took work, like, and uh, Jamie and Justin having the amazing relationship that they have. Mm -hmm. um, they've, I think, helped each other, you know, monitoring how included I was and how, you know, making sure I don't get interrupted. And um, and at one point that I was doing the minutes, you know, and I was mm -hmm. sort of the only person that was kind of managing the time, not because they purposely thought that I should, but because it was invisible to them. Sure. And I had just taken on that role. Yeah. And I felt very frustrated by mm. that, that role. Um, these sort of feminine roles that women are, you know, expected right. to take on and that we're good at, but that we're like, just because I'm good at it, it doesn't mean I'm totally. the only one who should be shouldering it. Yes. I've gotten so much out of being heard mm. on this podcast by men where I don't feel like I need to wrestle my way in. And it's been such a beautiful evolution. I feel really, really grateful for mm. all of it. And yeah, I, I get a lot out of like, sometimes I'll watch our little clips and I'm like, and like, I'll be talking and then there's like, Justin's like, and then Jamie's like, <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> like I nodding love it. approvingly. No, and, and I Amazing. think visual, I, I think that's an important visual to show people mm, yeah. you know and and I got a lot of comments being like you really do hold your own and it's um and it's amazing to see yeah men truly listening mm -hmm. and taking in and, and hearing and seeing women in that way unfortunately it's yeah it's still rare so yeah I, I feel like what we're doing is really cool and I feel really lucky to be a part of it it's so Amazing. cool to see. You guys Thanks. really are here for all of it. The yeah. hard yes. conversations, yeah. the mm -hmm. fun conversations, and the yeah. fact that you guys, what did we say it was? Two years? Mm -hmm. yeah. That you guys are such good friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just shows it shows how it can be done. Yeah. Yes. How we can all disagree and have different points of view and choose to stay in the room and have the hard yeah. conversations and then get even stronger, have an even stronger relationship after yeah. that. So yes. thank you for thank you for showing us how it's done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank it's beautiful. You. I appreciate it.
Mm-hmm. And yeah, to their anyway, to their credit too, like th- I sometimes I would challenge them at this table, and I was like, they're gonna cut it out, you know, or or they're gonna take, and they never did. Like, mm-hmm. I, and I really that's the work, yes. you know, like that's it, doing it, you know, in in front of everybody and with the with the failures or the you know the misses but okay so Mm. i i'm really in the process of deciding if i want kids and it's it's, i feel like i'm constantly in it uh and Mm. i constantly change my mind which makes me think i probably shouldn't (laughs) because i've i've been changing my mind so much part of it is yeah just the way that our society is organized i'm like am i gonna it just i'm i feel like mothers are set up to fail in Mm -hmm. in many respects Mm. and so i'm like i'm just gonna fail at it um, I also think that there's a lot of even you were saying, oh yeah, I googled this and like, oh I didn't know about this and you know that there's so much pressure to to like my parents I feel like had kids and they're like okay whatever like did they even read one book about parenting I don't know like how probably our parents not did it. and and like they didn't but, seem care to care that much yeah like, and <laughs> we turned out okay like a little fucked up but like okay and so you know do you and so and then there's a part of it where I I do feel like am I gonna lose myself mm. you know and and I. I'll find myself in the because again I I love the idea of of being a, a mom right and mm-hmm. and that is the, the the draw despite all of the negative things that are in you know populate my mind around it um, but yeah can women have it all like can you still preserve yourself even if you're a mom no hell yes. <laughs> So let's talk about that. I love yes. It. Let's get into let's, it. Let's get into it. <laughs> I say no because you don't preserve yourself. Okay. You become someone new. Of oh, course, okay. your essence mm. is always there, but you're not, you, there's no salvaging the you before motherhood. Absolutely not. Okay. If anything, you, you, you become like, your best self, your uh, gr- grander self, like you're like the pod opens up and you're like, I didn't know this existed, you know, okay. at least if you do the work behind it. Yeah. Um, but no, there's Very no true. self preserving who you were before becoming a mother. And that that's a good thing. There's, it's like a, re- is it a rebirth in a way? Yes. Oh my okay. gosh, it's such a rebirth. Yes, yes, yes. You birth a baby and you birth, birth a mother. A mother. So and we don't talk about I it, think, but that but that's and, the thing. And you both work with All mothers we need so much. I want you to bring it up. Yeah, is gather. Yes, like women need to gather and sit in circle together and mm-hmm. talk about these things. Meet with elders. Yes, use use your people. Call on me and Natasha. Yes, <laughs> we will talk your ears off. Mm. It's just about educating yourself. Preparing yourself. And we're not talking about Googling. No, no, not Googling. It's like Like, within community. Talk to real people. Okay. Do not Google (laughs) anything about birth or anything. Just stay away from Google if you can. It's just about gathering your the information that you need, knowing that you're stepping into something absolutely unknown. Will you be thrown some curveballs? Yes. yes. Will you be challenged? Yes. yes. Will you be taken completely outside of your comfort box? Yes. yes. Will you stretch and stretch and stretch? And I mean physically and <laughs> mentally and emotionally and spiritually. Yes. yes. <laughs> but what a freaking gift. I cannot think of anything more powerful than becoming a, a mother and stepping into motherhood. Of course, I think the first question that is really important to ask, and not in your head, but ask your body, do I want to be a mother? Hmm. Keep asking your body if it wants to be a mother hmm. and feel into that answer. And for many women, that is no. Mm-hmm. And that is what's absolutely aligned for their soul and their mission and their purpose on planet Earth. And that's more than okay. She's here to do something something else. Many of us, however, I think out of fear and because we get stuck in this mind chatter, we get so afraid of stepping into motherhood, rightfully so. Had I known how hard it was going to be, I very well might have just said, no, nah, I'm good. Yeah. I'm great on my own. Mm-hmm. And now, of course, having been a mother for eight years... I love the human I'm becoming Mm -hmm. and the woman that I'm becoming because I have my children. It taught me so much about myself and it has helped me find the medicine that I'm here to offer. And there's just so much, oh, what's the feeling, Natasha? It's Mm. like, I feel like I've just been marinating in in life and kind of being beaten and molded Mm -hmm. and now I'm 
just appearing as this <laughs> piece of clay that is finally blossoming and landing in her role. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy that I'm a mother. I just wish that I would have had and pulled in community in a different way yes. and not lived in that belief that I'm here to do it on my own because mm -hmm. that's what I was telling myself for a whole lot of years. Mm -hmm. And it crushed me. Mm -hmm. You can choose not to do that. Mm -hmm. And you can choose to just say, this is what I'm going to need for my partner. This is what I'm going to need for my friends. This is what I'm going to need for myself. And just as much as you put time into birth and pregnancy, do that with, I almost called it afterlife, um, <laughs> postpartum. And I mean postpartum for decades to come. Mm -hmm. What do you want that to look like? And then claim it. Mm -hmm. We can't do much about policies in our culture, that's gonna be way behind. But when women come together and work in wisdom and old, I mean, we're all about the ancient tools and mm -hmm. gathering women and ceremony and ritual and oh, like d dipping deep into these, this old ancient and yet very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Perfect medicine for mm -hmm. this time as well. Mm -hmm. You can choose where you, where you, where you exist in motherhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We suffered because we didn't know any better. <laughs> we didn't know. <laughs> Truly. We had to learn the hard way, and that does not have to be everyone's. And hard way, like in a very privileged way. Let me just be real about that. But yeah. it was still very yeah, hard Yeah, what was times. hard? What, was, what were the low points? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or, you know, points of opportunity for growth. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done. Yeah, I think it was just not knowing that I couldn't do it alone. Mm. And, and when I say alone, I don't mean that Jamie wasn't there. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, even just a couple shouldn't be doing parenting mm. and raising a child alone in their little box of a home. Like, it's just not, I, ha I had a friend once say, a nuclear family is a nuclear bomb, mm. just like waiting to go off. Oh. It's not how, sus that's not how we're built. It's not what communities are supposed to be like. Um, well, it's not a community. Exactly. Right. It's not it's a community. It's denying community. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I remember I had this voice. I had my little infant with me and Jamie would be working and I would, I had this voice. It was harsh. It was mean. It was critical. And it said, you have to figure out how to do this by yourself. Mm. And it told me that every day. It felt so like fear-based and like pushy. And there was this pressure of like, don't ask for help. You have to figure out how to raise your child. You have to know how to be a mother and have this child by yourself. Oh. Like, mm. and, and I finally had to like let that voice go and know that like, this is not healthy. This is not right. I, anytime I'm alone with my children for like more than two hours, I'm like, this ain't right. <laughs> Where's somebody? Anybody yeah. needs to come and like help <laughs> just shift the energy. That was really hard. Just being alone, not having someone else that did it already to be like, oh, let me hold the baby for you. Oh, that's normal. Oh, this was what helped me. Go rest. You know, like mm. you're dealing with so much after birth, right? Your body is healing, first of all. Mm -hmm. <sighs> just slam my hands on the table. Go there. Um, maternal health care, it like drops off after a woman gives birth. It like disappears. They check you in six weeks. They make sure you're not dying. You're like, go live your life. Go have sex. Bye. And that you like, there's so much missing in like allowing our bodies to rest, heal, recover emotionally, spiritually, physically, like all these things are happening. It's like, it's truly a profound moment in a person, a human body's life that we just like mm -hmm. ignore. We just send them home, see you later, go live life as normal. And it's like, it out. no, yeah. no, mm -hmm. like, yeah, figure it out. So it was just really hard, like not knowing what I needed, not knowing how to ask for it, even in a privileged space. Like it's still flipping hard and to be in an unprivileged space, even worse off, you know, like I think everyone should be involved in the raising of children, mm -hmm. best friends, aunties, neighbors, like we should be building trust and like relationships so that everyone feels safe to take part and help. Mm -hmm. 
And what are some of the like real nitty gritty, like granular ways that people can do that? Like I, I know there's been this trend going uh, around on TikTok of groups of seven mothers together cooking a huge meal and then giving each other Tupperware so that they each have a, a meal for every day of the week to mm, feed their families. And it's awesome. something different and yummy. And, oh, my God. Um, that sounds and, amazing. And some women, but some women were commenting, be like, must be great to have seven friends. You know, oh, that some women don't, yeah. you know, have that. And so how do you build that community or, you know, yeah, what what are, what are points in your in your motherhood, mm. you know, journey where you're like, I should have reached out at this point or I should have, you know, how do you, yeah, how do you build that? So... It needs to happen before the baby comes out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, even before a, a couple d- decides to have a child, I think they need to think about, honestly, who is our community? Who do we want to be in our community? Mm-hmm. Where are we living? Who are we living near? Right. Physically. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, do we want to live near your mom or do you want to live mm-hmm. near my mom? Do we do we have healthy relationships with our family? Do we have mm-hmm other families that have had children near us that can like just help, you know, learn from play dates, all that, Mm -hmm. you know, like, I feel like we don't build those kinds of relationships until like school years start. But that needs to happen before you decide to have a child. How are you building community? Who are your, who are, who's your circle? Who are you having dinners with? Who, who would you trust to take, watch your child? You know, like Mm -hmm. those things need to happen beforehand. And something that, that's that been my passion and, and kind of my work right now is helping birthing couples, families, prepare for the postpartum period. Because right now there's no information, there's no preparation. And I accompany them and guide them through like, this is what the mom needs. How are you going to set up rest for her? How much time work off are you going to get? Who's going to help is your mom coming over? She should come over. You know, like when people think like, oh, yeah, maybe my mom might come. Yes, she should yeah. come. You know what I right. mean? Just like really setting themselves up with the the proper nutrition, the proper rest, the proper support, um, the proper guidelines. Like if you are going to come visit in the first six weeks, make sure you bring a meal mm-hmm. um, or wash some dishes. Like I'm not here to entertain you. Like right. this is a healing period. You yeah. know, who? how are you just s- preparing yourself and your community at this time, mm. this super important time, because what I've learned is that even if you if you if you don't give yourself what you actually need, women need these things after birth. If you don't give yourself the rest, the nutrition, the all the things, yeah. you're still going to end up having to do it in your health journey later on, whether it's six years later, whether it's forty years later. It's going to catch up with you. Mm -hmm. So I feel like when we honor this intense period right after, like as a sacred time, let's like really help this mom who was pregnant for nine months. Let's at least give her like six weeks. Mm -hmm. And then there's not such ramifications. There's not such an uphill climb afterwards. And that's what it felt like for me. And I know for you as well. Just afterwards, it feels like such an uphill climb to recover again, to find yourself again, to right. n- realize, oh, I've become someone different. I've yeah. become someone new. Right. And accepting that and knowing that's going to happen. Um, so knowing how hard it is to be <laughs> a, a, a mother and to be married, what's your pitch to young women um, who are currently like, I don't want to do any of this. I'm selecting out of dating men um, and, you know, the idea of getting married to a man sounds like really rough and I don't want to do it. What's your pitch? (laughs) Well, (laughs) well, I think if you are a person, we talk a lot about working on yourself or I keep bringing it up. Um, But if you are that kind of person, you know how to find another person who is doing the same on themselves, right? So find a person who you know is willing to evolve and grow and clearly committed to the wild and crazy journey called life, right? So it doesn't take very long to know if you're with somebody like that or not. And once you have that person, um, which we are both very blessed to have, it is... But also they weren't like that when you met them. What, like yes, me, like they were though. They were. He okay. has grown and changed yes. so much. Right. I look back at pictures of myself from from our wedding day, and I'm like, who is that? <laughs> 
lady. <laughs> wow, and I have so much compassion for that little one. We've grown so much, but I knew how curious I was about myself and about life, and I was never going to stop growing. And I saw the same in him. Mm. We were kindred spirits. And the fundamental things we both agreed on, we are the opposites. We are so different from one another. But we have these core fundamental beliefs and values that have always been the same, and they are still there. So know that you're with somebody who's willing to grow alongside you. Otherwise, it will not work. And if you find a partner like that, know that it's so special to have somebody that can be your mirror and is going to frustrate the heck out of you, <laughs> but who is willing to sit there and hold you and love you through your shit and your glory um, and know that you will do the same for them. It's going to feel so hard when we're triggered by somebody, when somebody's so close that they know exactly how to trigger us too. Mm. But when you get on the other side of that, it's so special, it's so deep, and you get to experience a love for yourself and for another that just feels sacred. Mm -hmm. And you get to a place where you really feel like you're in sacred union. And you don't have to be in a partnership to find joy and bliss, of course, but there's something about a sacred union that you can't find anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's gonna take work. Which is why I keep going back to you need to be with somebody who's willing to do the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> and then about kids. So. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, my pitch is, here's my analogy always of marriage, is that it, you, it ends up being a mirror, like a full-length mirror. You're like, oh, okay. You're showing me who I am and mm -hmm. how I look today. Okay. And having children is one of those zoomed in right. mirrors at mm. like CBS hotels, where you yeah, can yeah, see yeah. the, the blackheads. The You're like, Ew. Like, <laughs> I didn't know I had that hair on my nose. Like that's what child uh, raising children is. Wow. Like they like zoom in. <laughs> like mm. my daughter, she used to. <laughs> She's so wise. She, she was like three or two, and she'd say, Mama, why did you say it like that? Like she knew that I had said something in a way that was oof. like, why was your tone like that? Like, oof. Yeah. Like that's yes. what – but here's the pitch. Motherhood. I think mothers are like the most sacred people on the planet. Yeah. And we just have to know that – Becoming parents is like the greatest, grandest venture. We just don't, like we're just dummies right now. Humanity is just forgotten or just never known. And I think as long as you know that, then you can start to like walk through the world and move through the world and make choices in a way that honor that like the sanctity of that position, prioritizing and just knowing your value as like someone that birthed another soul on this planet and is about to like climb Mount Everest with like, mm -hmm. I used to say that, I, I used to say that when postpartum period with after my first child, it felt like I was going through hell with an angel by my side. Oh. Like my newborn oh. was my angel mm -hmm. and I felt like I was in hell. Mm. But like you get to the other side and the angel's still there with you and you like get through it together. Like that's what it felt like. Oh. Um, so it's not <laughs> for the faint of heart. <laughs> but if right. you like want to like own yeah. Yeah. Um, that role... <laughs> then go for it and yeah. make sure you have a partner and a community. But what if you don't? What if you don't have a partner? What do you do? Because what, what, you do so much work with mothers. You know, if a mother approaches you and there, there is no uh, other person in the picture. Just make sure you have community. Yeah. Just make sure other people are there around you mm -hmm. helping you raise your child. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, even when I uh, did egg freezing, which is um, not compare, I won't even put it in the same category as motherhood, but it felt like a rehearsal yeah. for motherhood. I hated it. Ugh. I hate I hate needles. I hate 
dildos, <laughs> like fucking up my, you know, it's the trans, I hate transvaginal ultrasound. I call it a dildo, but it's, it's they really <laughs> put a trans, it's transvaginal ultrasound is like the biggest dildo you've ever, you've ever seen. And they just Ooh. like put it up you um, every two days. And a blood test every three days. Mm. Like I have to like mentally prepare for like 48 hours before even getting like my blood drawn once. Uh, and obviously it's surgery, you're under and, you know, and it's very, your body's changing mm. and you can't do anything and you're, you have bruises from all the, the shots and I, I really hated it like yeah. with passion and I was angry that I had to do it I was frustrated like why do I have to you know put yeah. my body through this why do I have to take time off of work to be able to you know um prepare for this and um yeah I had a lot of like resentment and frustration but then it was so cool like it turned out to be one of the coolest things I've ever done once it was done mm -hmm. because then I had this like profound appreciation for my body I had this profound appreciation for how powerful women's bodies are mm -hmm. like I knew, knew it theoretically but then like physically to be like whoa my body is create like literally these eggs are growing and this is the beginning I had this really spiritual experience where like my they were putting me under and I was nervous, you know, mm. natural. I, I don't know if other people are, but I was nervous. And uh, suddenly my future child was in the room with me. <gasps> oh, <laughs> guys, my goodness. And being like, it's going to be okay. And then I was like, oh, my God, this is the beginning of, like, mm. I'm going to tell you this story. Like, oh. when you're. Oh, you're going to be a <laughs> mama. Oh. There it is. There it is. Oh, there it is. Oh, you tell her happen. you have your answer. Yeah. No, it was – and she's still with me since then. That's the she, crazy thing. Like, she's, like, on, oh, on a little backpack. Like, stop oh, it. Liz. <laughs> so sweet. Oh, but then it's, like, a year goes by, and I go on – you know, I, I'm in – I meet people who are lovely but not great longtime partners mm -hmm. or, or who are, you know, you know, at my age also, like, already in a – you know, have kids already and don't necessarily want to have kids. And so mm -hmm. I've, I've come around to just being like, maybe it's not meant for me and, and maybe it's not meant to be. But I do feel this motherhood could be the most empowering and disempowering thing I could do. That paradox or holding those two opposites yeah. are, are really hard for me. And then, you know, part of me goes, well, don't put that pressure on yourself. And don't, you know, I have friends who, I don't know if you know about this, but there are apps where you track how many burps your kid does and oh, your baby's poops. And Oh, yeah. But oh, I'm like, what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't even answer my texts. Like, how am I supposed to... So yeah, I get I get as you can tell overwhelmed um, yeah. easily, and so I just think, oh my god, I'm gonna be. But then I go, this is my inner monologue. Then I'm like, but you know, I care so much. I, I'm always anxious about all my stupid little shit, and then I'll have a kid, and I, I won't care about all the little things. And then because the, I'm not gonna be in my head about my life, there will be something more important than all the little anxieties that I have. And so maybe mm -hmm. that'll be good. I don't know. I keep going back and forth. Mm. I can, oh, I can imagine. And it's such a big question, too. Yeah. It is such a big decision. Well, it's the biggest decision. It's the biggest yes. decision. Yeah. And I don't think it's ever going to get easy. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, most of us, we never get to the point where we're like, oh, I'm I'm ready. I'm ready yes, now. Right, right. To, you know, get hitched and yeah. have kids and do and do all the things. I don't think we ever arrive to that right. to that point. And I think sometimes. Yes, we are disempowered, but if we choose to, that disempowerment can turn into empowerment, right? That's right. that's the gift of that duality. And also I think it can be yeah, it can be so overwhelming. I'm not I'm not going to tell anybody or you <laughs> that is not going to be overwhelming and that you're not going to be frumpy and flustered and all whatever the <laughs> words are at times. I have um, sent Emily the deepest, oh. darkest text messages yeah. in motherhood, like yeah. just the things all you wanna, the yes. f-bombs and all so the caps and all the mm. like. We used to like vent text each other yep. in the early days, in like the darkest moment, Dark. right? Yeah. Because we knew, I knew that Natasha would be a safe space. She would not judge anybody for. It. She wouldn't judge me, my kids, my husband, nobody. She would just go, oh. Yeah, Mama, mm -hmm. I feel you. I'm so sorry. Saying a prayer for you right now. Mm -hmm. But what's so incredible about that journey, though, is that you get to rise back up. Mm -hmm. And there is something about motherhood and having been pregnant and then birthing a human being and then raising that human being that in and of itself is so empowering and it brings you back into your body. Mm -hmm. And you. it's just... Um, 
it's almost like a feeling of coming home, like I said about Justin earlier, but it's like really landing in my body and like you did, finding such respect and gratitude for this vessel, this instrument that we have, and realizing what it's capable of doing. Mm -hmm. It's such a gift. You're also both entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, how do you balance that? Obviously, I, I could feel this brewing inside me as I was going through my postpartum tumult and honestly didn't really have the time or space until my kids became like, you know, um, grade school children, you know, elementary. Um, and even then, like, I still have days where like the kids are sick and homeschool. I'm like, great. I got to like figure out my day now with kids at home and the sniffles. And I still got to like Zoom with somebody at three. Like, and I just figured I've learned yeah. through motherhood that there's always going to be a curveball. And I'm just like, okay, we're going to figure this out. Yeah. And I, I don't stress as easily or as often or as quickly. And I, I just still have to like ride the wave of life and motherhood. And just, we just happen to be in a place right now in our partnership where Jamie is got a schedule and he's got, you know, and is happens to be making more money right now. So like that's a, the priority in work life right now for us. Mm -hmm. But I still have the time. Like this weekend, I just was at a workshop learning mm -hmm. about postpartum care through Mexican traditional medicine. And Jamie held down the whole weekend with the kids so that I could go learn more for my work. So it's it's a dance. It's a juggle. It's not super easy. I don't get to like grow as quickly as I want. I don't get to post as much as I want. But it's like I'm figuring it out and I'm having grace and I'm taking it day by day and... My kids woke me up at 3 a.m. with sniffles and coughs last night, but so like, fun. and we woke up late and I took him to school late and it's okay. And I was at my client late and here I am. Like, yeah. you know, you just, yeah. you keep moving through it. And I, I just, I've learned to have much more grace and mm. forgiveness mm -hmm. of like the little things of like being late to school. They'll be okay. Yes. No one's yelling They'll at me. Okay. We're not in trouble. Right. You know, yeah. like all the pressure we put on ourselves. Yeah. Natasha is just bringing something really beautiful into the world, and I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. It's so needed. Yeah, it sounds really exciting. So tell us about the – tell us for people who are listening who want to learn more about what you're doing. Yeah, both so, of you. so I am – I'm offering postpartum preparation services for birthing families. I work with mostly the couple, and I educate them on the basic needs of a woman after birth. We go through a plan, you know, they figure out who they want there, how they want it, what kind of foods. We like create a game plan. And then at the end of the, at the end of about five or six sessions, I hold a workshop for the partner and their family, whoever their tribe is, whoever their community is that they know will be for them during the postpartum phase. And I tell them the plan, like, this is what she needs. This is what's important mm. for women postpartum. Mm. This is what happens with the hormones. This is what happens to her brain. This is why this kind of food is important. We go through the game plan of like everyone's role and how to step in and the timing. And then everyone just is more prepared and armed, right, when the time comes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Just trying to give women a fair chance after yeah. birth. Yeah. And Emily, tell so us about beautiful. the amazing work that you're up to. Yes. So I am the co-founder of We Are Ama, which is um, a lifestyle brand for mamas. So supporting mamas, but in a different way. And we just, we resource her with products and content to help her empower herself. And our whole belief is that a nurtured mama changes the world. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been doing for a few years now. And growing slowly because me and my partner, we're, we're both mamas. And it's okay. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to happen in a year. It yeah. can happen slowly. We've had very slow but steady growth. And it's going really well. And it's so well received. And I love, I love what we're doing. I adore it so much. And I'm also embarking upon a more... Um, whew, <laughs> <laughs> personal, very holy and sacred to me journey that has more to do with healing and being a healer. And as I said before, literally gathering women in circle and in ceremony where we together can remember who we truly are and hear our soul again. 
for the first time, maybe since we were five, hmm. connecting with and celebrating the sacred feminine. And I've spent the last two years diving deep into studies about the sacred feminine, working with a woman named Elaine Kalila Dowdy. And it's been profound. It has changed my life. Hmm. And now I'm just, I can't wait to bring this out into the world and gather my women and, and be in this frequency together because it's time that we truly remember our magic yeah. yes. and our power yeah. and our worth mm-hmm. and our belonging. Yes. Um, and I can't think of any more holy and sacred work than that. I'm wow. so excited. I definitely want to invite. Oh, yeah. my goodness. <laughs> because that sounds Done. amazing. Yeah. Um, I'm getting a note from our male, one of our male producers. Um, <laughs> What work is left to be done for the guys? We've been too easy on them so far. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Part, so, like specifically, uh, specifically our guys? Yeah, your Jenny. guys. Your guys. This is funny because I've for months now, I've known what conversation him and I need to have. And because of my lovely little programming, it's so hard for me to schedule the time to do it. Because I need to just sit down with my husband and find my voice and get very clear about what's in alignment for us and just say, let's make this happen. And it's something so seemingly small, but it's so important. So I think you guys have a similar thing. So he he can be so busy, right? Justin could be so busy and he can be so busy. He can stay up until midnight and do work and watch a movie that he needs to be watching, read a script that he needs to be reading and just like work, work, work. He goes to bed late, which means that he then sleeps in in the morning and every dang day and morning, I have to (laughs) rise up from bed very early to get the family ready for the day. And it is an unbelievable amount of work to pack Mm -hmm. lunch boxes and to make breakfast and then clean up Mm -hmm. and then make sure that the kids have the sweaters or the pants that they need and the the, 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 it just keeps going. It's so much Mm -hmm. and it's seemingly invisible. Mm -hmm. And it takes so much of my time. So dang early. And I would love for him to just, like this is what needs to happen. We need to schedule at least two days where the morning is his to make sure that the family's out of the door. So that I can just have my mornings of lighting a candle without rush, drinking my tea, pulling tarot cards, mantras, singing, meditating, stretching, and just getting into my sacred, beautiful day without any rush. And then maybe do that, do that little ritual for a short amount of time other mornings, but just to have him step up and see that work for what it is and take it on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The challenge is. is on. Uh-huh. Hopefully, you, by the time this airs, you will have had the conversation, and you'll be in lighting a candle uh, and doing your sacred feminine ritual. I will snap a ritual. picture of it for you yes. guys, and I will yes, share it with it. you. Yeah, it's happening. But that, and you had the same issue when you yeah. came on um, a couple yeah. uh, uh, when you came on the mm-hmm. season. Mm-hmm. Has that been? Has that changed? So, <laughs> check in. <laughs> What so was here's his version. The ch- here's the what's your ch- version? I know. I know. Here's the challenge. Soon after that episode, he went to Jersey and he was gone for like six weeks. Oh. So just, just the nature of his job is just like all over the place. Like one day it's the podcast. One day it's got to wake up early for that important meeting. One day he's flying off to da da da. So it's like hard to find a rhythm of like, okay, this is the day that Jamie wakes up with the kids. But what I have noticed since then is like more especially on the weekends of like rising up together at least so I'm not alone like the first couple hours on the weekends so there is like a more this like involvement of like being up helping with breakfast you know um I I just still think I've never said this out loud (laughs) (laughs) and I adore him and I love him and I know he adores me and loves me and I know I love you, Jaime. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> I still, uh, I, I don't know, or at least I don't feel like he really knows all the things that happens behind the scenes in like yes. managing a household. I agree with that. And I'm like, home too. Like if we could just like write the list down of like, this is mm-hmm. what I'm thinking about and mm-hmm. doing every day and every week. Yeah, every day and everywhere. Here's a long list that just keeps popping up that I'm I'm invisibly doing, mm-hmm. um, and just so that 
gaps are filled in more consciously. And he will, like when I was gone this weekend, he spent, you know, the Sunday like cleaning and, or, you know, and he like, he cleaned, which was great. But I think from my end, I just wish it was like a consistent, Mm -hmm. uh, a consistent task. I think we both have husbands that do do a lot. They do a lot. And I think it's very easy for you and I to go, oh, but they do so much. Mm -hmm. So I shouldn't be asking for this. Mm -hmm. And he is really busy Mm -hmm. and he is the main breadwinner. So I should really just, I should just really, I should just really like pull this load Mm -hmm. and just, just make it happen because that's what seems fair. Yeah. Right? It's true. And I, it's somewhere in me, though, there's just like that itch of like, mm, but does he have to stay up so late? Does he have to be so, like, such a victim of that patriarchal thing that we have to push, 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 do, 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 be, be, like, just be out there? Like, can he just say, and he's been really good at this lately, He can he just say, no, I'm going to take this evening for my family. No, that's going to wait so that I can go to bed early and get up early and get the kids out the door. I just know that it's possible. We just have to be strong enough to ask for it Mm -hmm. and schedule that meeting and put (laughs) it in the calendar and speak our needs. And then we can together figure out how they can still do their job while also showing up in the family life and know all the invisible things that Mm -hmm. need to be done. At least be aware of them and then start helping out with that because... I just think it's doable. Yeah. It makes me think of the, this these friends that I have that have a kid together, um, and they are the most kind of equal example, I think, of, of, a, of, a, of a partnership that, that I've ever sort of seen. And one of the things that's distinct about them is that he did take per, per paternity leave, like mm-hmm. for a couple of weeks. He didn't take it for as long as she did, but he, for a few weeks, you know, she went back to work and she makes more money, actually. It was a concerted decision. And because he had to do it, it wasn't invisible. Like, mm. right? It makes it visible. You don't, she didn't have to explain the things. He knows what the things are. Mm. And I think it's such a policy failure in countries, you know, Scandinavian countries where there is still, but it's still not perfect there. The domestic it's labor is, is, you know, and you who <laughs> live Scandinavian. <laughs> uh, but, but there are policy incentives for, yes. for it to be, you know, more equal. Mm-hmm. And, and even then it's, it's sort of not equal. But yeah, I guess listening to you talk, I feel frustrated that you have to, like, you're scheduling the meeting in the calendar to, you know, to, and, and even the fact that that needs to be told when these are their kids, like, mm-hmm. they, this is their home, this mm-hmm. is their bed, like, th- they're, they're there. And so, but, but at the same time, I know that it's, cons- I mean, what you're saying, there's so many, so, so many women who are probably listening, nodding their heads, being like, I'm in the same position. Why is that labor so invisible to men? Even for men who mm-hmm. talk about masculinity and talk about gender equality, right? Um, right. Life is very yeah. full, mm-hmm. and yeah. it's easy to get blind and ignorant. And to be honest with you, I was blind and ignorant to the fact that that was not balanced because I did not know my worth. Okay. I had not found my voice. Mm. And like I said before, I just assumed he's so busy, so I should just take this on. Right. And then waking up to the fact that this is really hard. This is really lonely work as well. And I'm bored out of my mind some so afternoons when I have to pack boring. that goddamn lunchbox yeah. one more time <laughs> and figure out if carrots are more interesting than celery. <sighs> right? But I'm blind to the fact that, oh, but it can be different. And I've only recently woke okay. awakened to that, that, oh, wait a minute. If this doesn't feel right, I can change it. So I think the reason that I'm the one scheduling it in the calendar is because that is powerful to me. That is me finally claiming the life Mm -hmm. that I want. And I go, all right, we're going to sit down this afternoon and talk about this. And there's something about that that is me finding my voice. And him and I, we've also been in this like, this little, like, this is how we do life. This is how we do life year after year. And then you just become that blind and ignorant person that doesn't see what's actually going on. And now that I'm waking up, I can help him wake up and say, hey, this is out of alignment. And then he gets to step up and choose to help out or not. Mm -hmm. I know that he will. I know that he's eager to. Um, But sometimes it has to start with us as the woman. Yeah. And that's okay because very often it just starts with a feminine because she is more plugged in. 
and like able to hear these things and then we pass it on and then they can choose to really step up. Not that it's always that way, but I think in, in relationships like ours, it very often starts with us waking up <laughs> and then claiming what we need and what we want. Waking up so that you can sleep in. Waking up it. so we can sleep in. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Um, we're about to wrap up, but before we do, um, I want to ask you, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you both. Mm. Um, you know, it's so funny. I don't ever do this part because oh. Jamie, particularly Jamie, Justin too, he just oh. hasn't been here as much. They express so much gratitude to the guest mm. and like will, yeah, just really reflect back mm. um, their, yeah, the knowledge and wisdom that's been shared and, and really see the person. So I'm not even, I'm like, right, I I get to do it. So thank you so much um, you. for sharing uh, first of all, for like crying for my future kid that doesn't right. exist. Still makes me want to um, cry. And it's so funny because I cry every time I talk about it. And this is the first time I like haven't. I'm like, am I dead inside? I'm crying for But um, I love that you cried because, yeah, I couldn't even talk about it without it's crying. It's so special. It's, it, it is. And I appreciate it's so it. so special. And there was a point where I was like, should I just ask them, like, should I have kids? And I was like, don't do that. And then you both basically volunteered it. And you're both so connected to uh, each other, mm -hmm. to yourselves, mm -hmm. to our lovely co hosts, J Justin and Jamie. Um, and I, yeah, I really uh, – we don't get to see each other very often, but right. I feel very connected to you mm -hmm. um, and very Likewise. grateful for the both of you. Mm -hmm. um, thank and you. Yeah, thank you, I just think you're both so amazing. You're awesome. Mm -hmm. And all the work you're doing with moms and um, – yeah, really thrilled. Um, I hope to, I get to be a mom to get to yes. enjoy. Well, we um, are here for you. Thank you. Ready yes. to talk we'll to you. Gather. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we'll gather. Thank you so gather. much. So our last question that we ask every guest um, is, what does it mean to be man enough? Just by being here, you are already enough, right? If we, were gonna, if we want to go really deeply spiritual, there is nothing that you can do to be man enough because you are, or to be enough because you are. But that can be hard to digest and hard to truly believe. So I feel like a great way of feeling like you are enough, whether that's just human enough or man enough, is to really find your purpose in your path and your bliss. Follow the crumbs, <laughs> follow the little joy crumbs, so that you can figure out what really is your bliss and what you are here to do. Because I believe that we're in, when we're in purpose in that way, unapologetically in our purpose, we just automatically feel enough without mm. having to do anything. So who are you here to be? We keep going back to that, know thyself. Mm. <laughs> then it doesn't take so much effort. I love that. Mm. Um. To add to that, that's a beautiful answer. Um, I think it's also remember, remembering to show up with humility and integrity and remembering that the world doesn't revolve around you, even if you are in your purpose. Yeah. Mm. That, you know, to still be outward looking and see how you can help others um, and serve others. Mm. Yes. Beautiful. Mm. Mm -hmm. What an amazing, amazing way <laughs> to end our 100th episode. Thank you so much, Thank Emily. Thank you so much Thank for you, having us. This was, was so, so lovely. It's really special. <laughs> Let's do it yeah. more often, Natasha. Okay. Let's do it. Is this a spinoff? Uh -huh. Is this a spinoff? Uh -huh. These two? Oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our producer just asked, what, what if I answer, what does it mean to be man enough? Oh, Wow. I mean, I've heard the best answers in the world, um, mm. including these two right here. So to me, being man enough is really tied to taking responsibility. Mm. Mm. And yeah, I can't think of anything sexier <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. than someone taking responsibility. Mm -hmm. mm. And... I talk a lot about the difference between emotional expression and emotional responsibility that I, I think, um, and this applies to everybody, but, but I think we muddle the two, that being emotionally intelligent or emotionally evolved is not just being able to express all your emotions and being like, I feel this, I feel that, I feel that. It's also being able to be like, Take, you know, taking responsibility for your emotions mm -hmm. and knowing how to regulate your emotions. 
I think for a long time, I was so focused on what men were doing wrong. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it meant that I was particularly my interpersonal relationships. And I realized like, oh, as soon as I took the focus off of them and I put it on me and took responsibility, mm -hmm. then that's when I started, um, yeah, just my whole life changed. It relates to masculinity and to, and, and to being man enough in, 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 in sort of the same way. Mm -hmm. like, and, and it's such a core tenet of masculinity. I think that if we presented men with that framing, for a lot of these, mm -hmm. quote unquote, more feminine things, like again, emotions, mm -hmm. if, we, if we present it as like taking emotional responsibility, I think it would um, land very differently right. and become a, a, a masculine feature as opposed to men bringing in their feminine, right? right, Or, right. or losing mm -hmm. something masculine by doing that. Right. Um, yeah, that's fine. Mm, mm. I love it. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. So if you like what you heard, you can check us out um, at www.manenough.com slash podcast um, and check us out wherever you get your podcasts on Apple, on Spotify. You can watch these two incredibly gorgeous, stunning, intelligent, sublime women on YouTube. And yeah, we are so glad that you joined us for hundred episodes. Oh, what? Such an honor. It's, so it's cool. such thank an honor. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you to our it's listeners so for being there throughout all of it um, and creating space for these incredible conversations. Mm, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Liz Plank. I'm Emily Baldoni. And I'm Natasha Heath. And this is Man, Man Enough. Enough. <laughs> that was so cool. The female version. I don't, <laughs> think, I don't think Justin and Jamie have, have a job anymore. <laughs>